Hi there, I'm Tawny and I'm 23, she, her. Let me tell you about my complicated relationship with my dad, Ivan. So I have some serious daddy issues. I mean, who doesn't? This is, of course, due to the toxic behavior of my dad because he wasn't exactly the best father figure. As far back as I can remember, it was like our household was constantly walking on eggshells. My mom, Betty, and I had to endure emotional and verbal abuse from him, and it was just so messed up. I don't know why he was so awful back then, but as I grew up, I couldn't help but resent him more and more. I mean, come on. A daughter should feel safe and loved around her dad, right? But instead, I found myself rebelling against him. I'd argue with him even when my mom, who is the sweetest person you'll ever meet, couldn't say a word to him. Our arguments would escalate into screaming matches, and it got so bad that our neighbors started calling the police on us several times. Can you imagine how toxic that was? It was like living in a war zone. I just couldn't stand how he treated us and how he made my mom cry all the time. As I got older, I became more vocal about my feelings and called him out on his behavior. But it was like talking to a brick wall. He never listened or tried to change. It was frustrating and heartbreaking at the same time. I remember the first real time I stood up to him. I was only 12. Dad, I can't take this anymore. The way you treat us is just so wrong. What are you talking about, Tawny? I provide for this family and this is how you talk to me? It's not just about providing for us, Dad. You're always yelling at Mom and me for no reason. You call us names and make us feel worthless. Tawny, please don't argue with your father. Let's just calm down. No, Mom, I won't stay quiet anymore. He can't treat us like this. Oh, listen to Miss Perfect here, acting like she knows it all. You don't seem to understand that we have to treat each other with respect and kindness. I never claim to be perfect. Tony, please, let's not fight. Mom, you deserve better. We both do. You shouldn't have to put up with his constant anger and criticism. You think you know everything, huh? You're just a kid. I may be a kid, but that doesn't mean I can't see what's happening. You've been hurting us for years and it's not right. Tony, please stop. Let's just try to get along. No, Mom. I won't stay silent anymore. We need to stand up for ourselves. You will not talk back to me like that. I won't be silenced. We deserve to be treated with love and respect, not fear. That's it. Go to your room now. Fine, but I won't back down. We need to change, Dad, or I won't be a part of this toxic environment anymore. Despite all the pain and anger, there was still a part of me that yearned for a loving and supportive father figure. I wanted to have those special daddy-daughter moments that I saw in movies or with my friends. But with Ivan, it felt like an impossible dream. I remember another time when he punched me. I was 14. Dad, is that you? Are you drunk again? It's the middle of the night. Don't you have work tomorrow? Mind your own business, brat. I don't need you watching over me. Watching over you? I'm worried sick about you. Do you even realize how your drinking affects our family? Oh, here we go again. The little princess thinks she's so much better than me. It's not about being better, Dad. It's about you putting yourself in danger and hurting us in the process. Mom's always terrified when you come home like this. Mom's always terrified. Wow, poor Mommy. Terrified, huh? She's a grown woman. She can handle herself. It's you I gotta take care of. You're missing the point. She shouldn't have to handle this. It's funny, you know, how I have to take care of a grown man because he's just a man-child. 
Watch your tone, young lady. You don't know anything about life. I may not know everything, but I know this isn't right. You're hurting yourself and hurting us too. You think you can lecture me, huh? You're just a spoiled brat. I'm not a spoiled brat, Dad. I'm your daughter, and I deserve to have a father who cares about us and doesn't put us through this pain. You better watch yourself, or you'll regret it. I won't back down, Dad. You need help, and I won't stop until you get it. We all need a better life than this. That's when he lunged forward and punched me square in the face. I immediately felt the blood pouring out of my nose. Even though I was in pain, I stood my ground. Just go away, Tony. You don't understand anything. No, Dad, you don't understand. You're not alone in this. But you need to face your problems instead of drowning them in alcohol. You're sick, and you need help. Big yikes! Am I right? Well, unfortunately, this was the norm for our family, and it sucked big time. I felt like I had to grow up quickly, which no child should do. But one day, everything changed. It was a random Sunday afternoon when I was fifteen, and my mom and I were playing cards on the kitchen table. Out of nowhere, there was Ivan, my father, looking all distraught, holding a duffel bag in his hand. Honestly, I didn't feel any sympathy for him at that point. I pretty much hated him by then. I didn't even call him Dad anymore. It was just Ivan. He seemed sad when he spoke, saying he had to go on a trip. I couldn't help but spit out something spiteful, telling him I didn't care where he was going. But of course, he ignored me. Mom asked when he'd be back, worried about the rent that was due soon. Ivan said he'd be back by the end of the week, but that was the last time we saw him. A week passed, then two weeks, and still no sign of him. The rent was due, but he wasn't answering any calls. Mom. My grandma Harper and my granddad Frank tried everything to reach him, but nothing worked. Two weeks turned into a month, then two months, six months, and then a whole year, and still no sign of Ivan. Mom cried a lot during that time, struggling to pay rent on her own. I felt so bad, and I hated his guts even more because of what he was doing to my poor mother. We got kicked out of our place eventually, my childhood home, and since Mom didn't have any parents, Grandma Harper and Granddad Frank were kind enough to let us stay with them. Thank God for that. Am I right? At the beginning of Ivan's disappearance, my mom filed a missing persons report, but Ivan was never found. Everyone assumed he was dead, and we even had a little funeral for him, even though there was nothing to bury. It was tough for everyone, and even I found myself crying sometimes. Eight years had passed since he was last seen, and life went on without him. Eight freaking years, y'all! Life had been a roller coaster ride during that time. But you know what was amazing? My mom, Betty, finally got her groove back. It was like she was blossoming without that deadbeat dad dragging her down. After my dad disappeared, it was tough at first. My mom still held on to the hope that he was alive somewhere out there. But even if she was right, we eventually had to accept the reality that he might never come back. It was hard, especially for my mom. But slowly, we picked up the pieces and moved on. She threw herself into work and started focusing on building a better life for us. She worked tirelessly to make ends meet, and I admired her resilience. She refused to let his absence define us. And let me tell you, it wasn't easy for her, but she kept pushing forward. It took some time, but she found her joy again. She started making new friends and rediscovering old hobbies. I could see her smile more often. And that made my heart happy. I was just a kid back then, but I knew she deserved all the happiness in the world. But then, life sucker punched us again. After eight years of being without Ivan, we lost Granddad Frank. 
my grandma's rock in a terrible car accident. It was like a nightmare, and we couldn't believe he was gone. That drunk driver turned our lives upside down, and we were left grappling with the pain and emptiness. Grandma Harper, well, she was hit the hardest. Losing her son and her husband within such a short time, it felt like her world shattered. She was like a broken puzzle, and we didn't know how to put her back together. Mom and I tried our best to be there for her, but grief is a beast that's tough to tame. In those dark days, all we had was each other. Anyone who's organized a funeral, especially on a budget, will tell you it's a whole roller coaster of emotions. We were all dealing with Granddad Frank's funeral, trying to get everything organized while struggling with our grief. It was tough, but thank goodness for the community who stepped in to help us through it all. So picture this. The funeral was underway and we were trying our best to keep it together. You know, be strong for mom and grandma Harper. But then out of nowhere, it was like I saw a ghost. Seriously, my heart stopped for a second. There, coming towards us, was none other than my long-lost, supposedly dead dad, Ivan. I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, it had been years since he vanished, and everyone assumed he was gone for good. But no, there he was, looking like a complete wreck. I honestly didn't think it was him at first. I thought it was a homeless person who maybe lost his way, but nope, it was Ivan. It was shocking to see him like that. So thin, with a dirty beard and yellow teeth. He was like looking at a total stranger. My emotions were all over the place, and before I knew it, a scream escaped from my lips. I couldn't help it, you know? It was like all those years of hurt and anger just erupted at once. And guess what? My mom and grandma saw him too, and they were just as shocked as I was. Well, let me tell you, that sight was too much for my poor mom to handle. She fainted from the shock and I had to jump into action, trying to revive her. It was all so overwhelming. Thankfully, Grandma Harper stepped in and started fanning her, but I was left standing there, facing my dad after all those years. It was almost like I went into autopilot, though, having to be tough and stoic, just like all those years ago. I could feel the anger and confusion bubbling inside me, but I knew I had to stay strong for the sake of my family, so I took a deep breath, squared my shoulders, and walked up to him. It was like a mix of relief and anxiety washed over me. Part of me wanted to run away, but I knew I had to face him, confront him about everything. Oh, it was such a mess. I couldn't believe my eyes and all those emotions were just bubbling inside me. I took a deep breath, and with a trembling voice, I demanded answers from him. I mean, he disappeared for eight freaking years, and now he suddenly shows up out of the blue? Like, what the hell happened? But of course, he had to be all mysterious about it. He said it was hard to explain why he was gone for so long. Hard to explain? Seriously? I was so fed up with his games. I pushed him, yelling at him, trying to get some kind of response out of him. But all he did was shrug me off and act all aloof. And you know what he said? He dared to tell me that he didn't owe me any explanation. After everything he put us through, he didn't feel like talking to me because we hated each other. Like, come on, that's not an excuse. I wasn't about to let him talk to mom and grandma without spilling some answers first. I told him he couldn't just waltz in and act like everything was okay. But he just brushed me off and said he was there for the funeral. As if that was all he needed to say. Ivan completely disrespected our boundaries and pranced on down to where the funeral was being held. And that's when I saw that my mom was thankfully awake again. She was sitting up on the grass, drinking water and being fanned by Grandma Harper. Things were getting tense and the crowd of people at the funeral started whispering and looking at us. I was so embarrassed, but I tried to keep them at bay, asking them to give us some space to deal with our family drama. 
Thankfully, they all dispersed with a distant cousin of ours directing them to Grandma Harper's place so that they could have some refreshments. Mom, who was always the sweetest and kindest person, looked at Ivan like she wanted to murder him. I had never seen her like that before. The tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife. Mom looked at him, her eyes full of anger and sadness, all at once. She said, It would have been better if you didn't come. Why are you here? And you know what he said? He had the nerve to claim he heard about Grandad's passing and wanted to pay his respects. Like seriously, after all this time, that's the best excuse he could come up with? Mom wasn't having any of it though. She saw right through his BS and called him out on it. You know that's not true. If you cared, you would have come home eight years ago like you promised. Hell, you could have come home literally any time before now. What the hell is wrong with you? She didn't hold back. And honestly, I was so proud of her for standing up to him. But Ivan was a mess, stammering all over his words and fidgeting like crazy. It was like he couldn't stand still. And then I noticed something off about him. He was scratching himself like crazy and his eyes seemed all distant. It hit me that he might be on drugs or something. Without hesitation, Mom asked what we were all thinking. Are you high right now? She wasn't holding back any punches, that's for sure. Ivan tried to come up with some explanations, saying a lot had happened in the past eight years and that he got mixed up with the wrong crowd, but he assured us he was doing better now. What a load of crap. Mom chuckled bitterly and then just broke down sobbing. I wanted to hug her and tell her everything would be okay, but I was so angry at Ivan. I couldn't help myself. I started yelling at him, telling him to go back to wherever he came from because no one wanted him there. But he was trying to ignore me like he always did. But I wasn't about to let him off the hook that easily. I kept on yelling and it seemed like I was impossible to ignore because of how loud and angry I was. Get out of here! You have no right to be here! Let Grandad rest in peace for God's sake! Why are you making such a big deal out of this? Because you abandoned us. You left us to struggle to deal with everything on our own, and now you dare to show up here like you're some kind of hero? You're a joke, Ivan. I had my reasons! Reasons? What reasons could justify leaving your family behind like that? We needed you, Dad. But you were too wrapped up in your messed up world to care about us. I don't have time to deal with you, kid. Step aside. Mom, Mom, look at me. Grandma Harper had been quiet this whole time. She had a blank stare and was looking off into the distance, furrowing her brows now and then. I placed my hand on her shoulder to comfort her, and she responded by sighing and leaning in, as if she was snapped back into reality. He's here for the inheritance. Mom, please look at me. Ivan, you are the scum of the earth, you know that? You're worse than the sewage. Mom, please. Tawny, Please tell this man that I want nothing to do with him. I have nothing to say to him. Ooh, burn. Even his mother didn't want to claim him. I just need to get my inheritance and then leave. Those friends I told you about, well, turns out I owe them some money and... That's none of our concern, sir. Please leave. We are grieving. Come on, Mom. You're gonna act like you don't know me, seriously? I don't know who you are. Please leave before we call the police. Mom, it's me, Ivan, your son. I don't have a son. My son died eight years ago. I don't know who you are. I'm not messing around, Mom. And we're not messing around either, you bozo. Get away from this place. I'm not talking to you. But I'm talking to you. All my life you've ignored me, and now you're getting a taste of your own medicine. Shut up. Mom! 
Mom! Mom, these people don't play around, okay? Just give me the money and I'll come back, I promise. I'll explain everything, okay? I'll explain everything to all of you. Just please, give me the money. I need the money. I need the money, goddammit. I need the money. Give me the money. We all just stood there looking at him with blank expressions on our faces. Ivan's pleas were getting more desperate and louder, but it was falling on deaf ears. He even dropped to his knees in front of Grandma Harper, begging her to listen, but we didn't pay attention to his cries. I need the money, he kept repeating, as if that was supposed to justify everything he put us through. But after all those years of abandonment, his words meant nothing to me. I was done listening to his excuses. I grabbed a shovel that was nearby and I whacked him in the head with it. He was knocked out cold. Thank you for that. No problem. His cries were getting on my nerves. You want to know the funny thing? Since he got here, he hasn't even taken one look at his father's grave. I don't know what happened to him, but he looks awful. Now the outside is reflecting the inside. Do you think that these friends of his are going to kill him if he doesn't get their money? Probably. I mean, if he's doing drugs, he must be doing some other crazy crap that would get him killed. Do you think we should give him the money? Why don't we ask Grandad? Hey, Grandad, should we give Ivan the money? Say nothing if the answer is no. My mom and grandma amused me and we all intently listened for Grandad's answer. Of course, there was silence. Well, looks like we got our answer. What a sad and pathetic man. I'm glad Frank isn't here to see this. Let's go, you guys. We'll find a police officer who's patrolling the area and tell them of the hobo who was near the grave. And with that, we left Ivan there and proceeded with the funeral in our home. I don't know what happened to my dad after that, but I never saw him again. I'm sure he's dead, though, for real this time. Hi, I'm Kat, and I'm 25 years old. I just got married to my boyfriend of two years, Nate. We met at Walmart and bonded over some mac and cheese. He asked for my number and I obviously said yes because who could say no to that cute face. It was a very random place where we met, but as we started talking more and going on dates, we totally fell in love. We realized how compatible we were with each other and then Nate proposed. It was not some fancy proposal, but it was the sweetest and I couldn't have said no. We were making a grocery run at the same Walmart and he said he wanted to get some mac and cheese. When we were at the mac and cheese aisle, I turned around and there was Nate on his knee with a ring in his hand. I obviously said yes. The wedding couldn't go as dreamy as the proposal went. Unfortunately, because my very own sister Clarissa was hell-bent on ruining the day for me. Let me share a bit more about Clarissa and myself. She's one year older than me and has always been the shining star of our family. Throughout my upbringing, my mom constantly compared me to her, pushing me to be like my older sister. It felt like a never-ending competition with Clarissa, from stacking blocks in kindergarten to vying for the prom queen title at prom. She consistently set high standards that I couldn't surpass. On the surface, she seemed better in every aspect. Better grades, being a state-level ice skater until middle school, and in high school, becoming the class president and a popular cheerleader. Everyone wanted to be her friend, and she even got accepted into an Ivy League college. Her first job after graduation was far superior to mine. Unfortunately, because my parents always boosted her ego and prioritized her, I found myself living in her shadow. I was just an average girl in school, and one incident that struck me was 
when I started taking cello lessons in middle school. But as expected, Clarissa also joined in, and being the perfectionist she is, she outshone me. I eventually quit, and ever since, I have felt like I became invisible, lost in her achievements. I won't lie; I couldn't help but feel jealous of her success. I hated being her sister, but I never hated her. Clarissa has always been like this, super focused on herself and making everything about her. But to be fair, it's not all her fault. Things have been this way in our family forever. At dinner, it has always been about Clarissa and what she's up to. It's like she's the center of attention all the time. In college, I chose to study literature, pursuing my own interests and passions. Now I work for a small publishing company where my income might not be extravagant, but it's enough to sustain my lifestyle. Clarissa had already moved out and got her own apartment, while I kept jumping back and forth between Nate's apartment and my parents' place, and it was a bit embarrassing for me as I didn't have my own place. However, I was focused on saving up money so that I could eventually get my own place too. When I first started dating Nate and shared how we met with Clarissa, she started bullying me for it. Oh, only a creep who lives in his mom's basement would hit on girls like that in Walmart. Clarissa, could you not be mean for once? He is a nice guy, and he is into coding for starters. He treats me well. You will know if you try to get to know him. I decided to make the announcement of Nate's proposal over dinner, so I invited Clarissa for dinner at our house. Hey, Clarissa. Hey, Cat. Come over for dinner at the house today. Mom's making your favorite key lime pie for dessert, and I have a special announcement to make. Don't tell me you're pregnant. Mom and Dad would have to take care of two babies then. Come on, don't be such a meanie. Ha <laughs> ha! I'm just pulling your leg. I'll be there. When I made the announcement, everyone was happy for me and congratulated me. I told them we were getting married in two months, and Mom and Dad couldn't stop talking about how happy I made them with the news. Clarissa also congratulated me, but I could sense some jealousy from her, and I wasn't sure why. Is something wrong, Clarissa? Nothing really. I'm just shocked. Why would Nate marry you? I thought it was just a casual thing. He could have anyone he wanted. He's successful and handsome. Give me a break, Clarissa. It felt like maybe Clarissa didn't take the news so well because, for the first time in our lives, she wasn't the center of attention. Everything wasn't about her for once. Perhaps she also didn't like the idea of me getting married before her. After all, Clarissa was still single and had trouble keeping relationships for more than three months. She was always the first to do things in our family, and maybe it bothered her that I was having a moment for myself with our parents. Then it was time to begin the wedding preparations, and right from the start, I made a grave mistake. Instead of choosing Clarissa as my maid of honor, I asked my best friend Haley to take on that role. I love my sister very much, but I never felt a strong connection with her. Her initial reaction to my engagement had already weirded me out, and she had been expressing doubts about the whole thing. I couldn't risk letting her have control over my wedding. Something told me she wouldn't do things right. When I told her that Haley would be my maid of honor, she didn't seem bothered at first. However, a couple of days later, Mom wanted to talk to me. I heard you asked Clarissa to just be a bridesmaid and made Haley your maid of honor instead. Well, Mom, you know Clarissa and I have never been that close. She doesn't know me as well, and I don't want my wedding to be anything less than perfect. I'm sure Haley would do a better job. I don't know about that, but you hurt your sister. You two are supposed to be on the same team. Mom, I just have this feeling that Clarissa isn't in favor of this wedding. Maybe she wanted to get married first, and I fear she might try to sabotage it. She's your sister. Why would she do that? I was done with the conversation, and the decision had been made. 
With that settled, Nate and I began the wedding preparations. For the wedding venue, we chose a charming wedding courtyard and we went ahead and booked the place. It felt like the perfect location for our special day. After finalizing the wedding venue, I had other important tasks lined up with my friends, including Clarissa, that needed to be taken care of. We started with shopping for my wedding dress. I had created a mood board to find the perfect dress that matched my vision, and after trying out various designers and visiting different stores for a week, I finally found the dress of my dreams. Haley, Clarissa, and my mom were with me during this special moment. The wedding gown was a gift from my parents and it was priced at a whopping $3,000. Stepping out in a beautiful white in bold drawer mermaid gown, I instantly knew it was the one for me. As the veil was placed on my head, my mom's eyes got all teary and it was such an emotional moment. But leave it to Clarissa to ruin it. She just had to drop that nasty comment. Sure, the gown is gorgeous, but I'm sorry, I have to be honest with you. You don't have the body for it. You look fat. Haley had to swoop in and remind me not to let Clarissa's negativity bring me down, so I brushed it off, kept my cool, and bought that dress anyway. Next, we moved on to look for the bridesmaids' dresses. We decided on a beautiful coral satin dress for all the bridesmaids. However, Clarissa, in her usual controlling nature, insisted that pink wasn't her color. It was frustrating because my wedding had a specific theme, and after much bickering, we compromised and chose the closest color to coral, which was salmon. Clarissa was just being problematic and selfish at this point. Counting all the times Clarissa tried to bring me down would take forever. Those two months leading up to the wedding were a roller coaster of stress. Cake tasting, flower picking, seating arrangements, it was all overwhelming. Thank goodness for Nate and Haley who were constantly supporting me and helping me out. She would constantly try to sabotage me or say hurtful things that made me question my decisions. She kept making snide remarks, trying to show me that if it were her wedding, things would be perfect and she would do it way better. I wish she could just be happy for me instead of trying to overshadow my special moment. One week before the wedding, Clarissa had taken some time off work and moved in with us temporarily. My parents were out running errands when Nate asked if he could come over to share something important. It was just Clarissa and me at home and Nate had arrived, joining me in my bedroom. Nate handed me a little gift. Here's a little gift. My grandma would want you to have it. He handed me a box and as I opened it, I found a beautiful vintage necklace inside. Oh my God, Nate, is this for me? I couldn't be more honored. I wish I could have met your grandma in person. This is so sweet. I love you, baby. I love you too. The doorbell rang and I hurried downstairs to find the Amazon delivery guy waiting. I quickly signed for the package, taking it from him. As I made my way back up the stairs, I could hear muffled voices coming from my room. Curious, I tried to listen in without being noticed. I seriously couldn't believe it when a guy like you proposed to Kat. What do you mean? You're successful, making apps, and let's face it, you're way too good looking for someone like her. You're like out of her league. Clarissa, I think Kat is my dream girl. She's beautiful and passionate. This necklace would look better on my neck. And you know what would look better on yours? My arms instead of Kat's. Get off me. I barged into the room and it seemed like Nate had pushed Clarissa away from him. It's not what you think, Kat. I know, Nate. I heard everything. Clarissa, can you stop acting all crazy? Are you this desperate trying to throw yourself at my man? What's gotten into you? Try to act like an adult for once. We're not kids, and this isn't some competition. You've spent your whole life living in the spotlight, and now that I have it for once, you've gone all insane. News flash: the world doesn't revolve around you. 
I'm sorry. Please don't tell mom and dad about this. They're going to hate me. Just get out of my sight. I'm disgusted by you right now. Clarissa left my room and Nate tried to comfort me. I decided not to tell mom and dad about the incident as I didn't want to create more drama. I was already stressed about the wedding and adding fuel to the fire wouldn't help. I didn't even want Clarissa at the wedding anymore. I confided in Haley and she agreed that it was best not to bring it up. Who knows what Clarissa might do next? But let me tell you, I was so mad at her. Who would stoop down that level and flirt with their sister's fiancé? That was some next level messed up stuff. She seriously needed some major help pulling off a stunt like that. I was just fuming with anger and disappointment at her. Like, why would she even go there? It was beyond me. But then, just three days before my wedding, I heard a knock on my door. Cat, I know my apology doesn't hold much value right now, but I'm really sorry for everything. Not just about the Nate situation, but for how I reacted to your wedding news and poked at you for the past two months. My jealousy got the better of me. You know, I haven't been in a stable relationship for a while, and being the older sister, I wanted to be the one getting married first. Seeing all the attention you were getting made me feel so lonely. I realize now that Nate loves you for who you are, and no one has ever seen me like that. I don't know what I was doing. I owe an apology to Nate, too. I know we didn't start off on a great foot, but I really want your wedding to be perfect. You're my little baby sister, after all. Oh, come here. I was taken aback by her words, and surprisingly, all the hurtful things she said and did started to fade away. I did not know what to say, so I went in for a hug, thinking it was a genuine moment of reconciliation. Little did I know she had something else in mind. We had a little bachelorette party at a cool club, followed by a rehearsal dinner the next night before the big day. I was totally shaken by how Clarissa was on her best behavior. Like, who is the new and improved version of her? It was almost like she was trying to make up for all the drama she had caused earlier. But hey, I wasn't complaining. I was just hoping she'd keep it together for the actual wedding, too. It was the day of the wedding and things were in full swing. Hairdressers, makeup artists were buzzing around. Everyone seemed to be in a panic. My cousins, who were part of my bridesmaid squad, were already at our place. Haley and Alex, my other friend and also bridesmaid, were there too, all dolled up in their pretty salmon dresses. All the attention was on me as I got my hair and makeup done. Clarissa complimented me on how beautiful I looked. When I put on the dress, my mom and grandma couldn't stop crying and I was just overwhelmed with emotions. We did a quick toast. But to be honest, I still had a major cold feet. Then came the first look with Nate, and we both turned into a puddle of tears. After that, the photo frenzy began, capturing all those moments before the moment. Walking down the aisle, holding my bouquet, I started the walk with my dad, followed by my awesome bridesmaids. The ceremony was beautiful, and finally, Nate and I were officially husband and wife. The evening was a blast with music, food, and endless chatter. Everything seemed to be going perfectly. Nate and I were mingling with the guests. We were on cloud nine taking care of the guests and eagerly waiting for our wedding cake to be brought in. But then, out of freaking nowhere, I spotted a familiar face in the crowd. Max, my ex-boyfriend from college. What the actual hell was he doing here? I was shaken to my core when I saw Clarissa holding Max's hand as they swaggered over to me. Like, what on earth is happening right now? This was some next-level drama I did not sign up for. Max, what are you doing here? Max was clearly wasted and all those memories of our college days came rushing back. Ugh, he was into partying, drugs and just being a total mess. No wonder we broke up. Congratulations, kitty cat. Who invited you? Seriously? He's my plus one. Are you kidding me? Why would you do this? 
Oh my God, Clarissa, you're driving me insane. Who's this dude? Well, Kitty Cat and I share some history together. They sure do. My blood was boiling with fury. I had never hated Clarissa more than at that moment. I couldn't believe she would do something so selfish and disrespectful. I felt terrible for Nate. He looked totally weirded out by Max's presence, and who wouldn't be? But just when I thought things couldn't get any worse, disaster struck. The freaking champagne glass was hit with a silver spoon, and that dreaded ting 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 sound filled the air. It was time for the speeches, and of course, Clarissa, not missing the opportunity to steal the spotlight, dropped Max's hand and rushed to the front, snatching the microphone from Haley. I couldn't even believe my eyes at that point. This was supposed to be the happiest day of my life, and she was turning it into a total nightmare. I didn't know whether to scream, cry, or do both. I just wanted this whole circus to end. All right, all right, everybody, gather round. Let's have some fun. So here we are at Cat's wedding, and let me just say, it's been a roller coaster of emotions for me. Let's talk about the groom, Nate, over here. You know, Nate, you're supposed to be the groom, but honestly, I've seen more enthusiasm from a sloth on a lazy Sunday afternoon. I mean, I get it; one wouldn't be as stoked to marry my sister, but Nate, how hard is it to keep up appearances? Well, let us move on to the bride over here, Cat. What can I say about her? She is a nobody. She has always tried to be me. I mean. I would not even know how it feels to be her, poor thing. But come on, let's be real. I'm the prettier and smarter sister. That's why we have Max here, Cat's ex-boyfriend, as my plus one. I wouldn't be surprised if Nate hits on me sometime later. Haley quickly took the mic away from Clarissa, trying to divert the guests' attention by announcing that the cake had arrived. My tears were streaming down my face, and I just couldn't go on with the evening. Nate was being super supportive, trying to comfort me while all this drama unfolded. And just when they brought out the cake, Clarissa went and pushed it like a total wrecking ball, and it fell flat on the floor. I couldn't contain my anger any more, and it all just spilled out. Just leave, Clarissa. I don't want you here. I don't want to see your face ever again. My voice was shaking with frustration and hurt, and I knew I should have been stronger. But I was going through a mental breakdown. Clarissa looked stunned, and for a moment, her drunken bravado faded away. It was clear that my words had hit her hard, and I could see a flicker of remorse in her eyes. But it was too late. The damage was done, and I couldn't take back what I had said. The pain and anger were still there, bubbling inside me like a volcano. Haley, Alex, can you please escort Clarissa out of here? And so they did. With Clarissa gone, Nate took over the mic. Hey everyone, I just want to thank you all for being here and celebrating this special day with us. I know things got a bit heated, but let's not let that overshadow the evening that lies ahead of us. And to my wife, Cat, I love you with all my heart, and I promise to be there for you. To support you and to love you unconditionally through all the ups and downs of life. Today might not have gone exactly as we planned, but it's a reminder that life is unpredictable, and we have to cherish every moment. After the wedding, Nate and I had an amazing honeymoon in Italy, and it was the perfect way to unwind and enjoy each other's company. Living our best life, exploring the sights and devouring the delish Italian food, but the whole drama with Clarissa at the wedding still had me feeling down. I moved my stuff to Nate's place, but Clarissa was MIA. No calls, no texts, nada. My parents are mad at me for standing up to her and throwing her out of my wedding. Honestly, I had enough of Clarissa's toxic energy. Cutting her out of my life was the ultimate power move. I mean, how could she be so heartless? No apologies, nothing. No way was I going to forgive her for that mess. As for my parents, they better wake up and see that Clarissa's the one stirring up trouble. She needs to take responsibility for her actions. A week went by since we were back from Italy. 
And still, nothing from the family. I'm standing tall and holding my ground. If they finally get it and show me some love, I'll consider talking things out. Until then, I'm focusing on my new life with Nate. Hi, how are you all? I'm Brenda. I'm currently 29 and will be 30 in two months. I have recently gotten out of a horrible experience related to my husband and his mother. I swear, I used to think that marriage is not that difficult to handle. But boy, was I wrong. Yes, I'm a strong girl since I managed. When I was unmarried, I had my life pretty well and sorted. I had a job as an assistant vet. My life was surrounded by pets and to be honest, I loved being around them. I loved adventure. I had an old bike belonging to my father. I often took it out for a spin. If my dad didn't have much sentiment towards it, I would have taken it for myself. My dad raised me single-handedly and never made me feel like I didn't have a mom. He is an excellent father and I'm really lucky to have him. I moved to Chicago where I got a job as an assistant caregiver to a veterinary clinic. It started very smoothly and I was picking on the process fast. I met John very unexpectedly. I was very late once and had to take a cab. The cab driver was handsomely single. He is the epitome of a charming boy next door trope. He had some bomb ass features, especially his hair. It looks so soft and silky. He was my type. He was also too smooth with his words. So, ma'am, where to? His smile was radiant and he gave me a cheeky smirk now and then. Sometimes he would lock eyes with me through his mirror. I would blush, but I didn't give any unnecessary signs. What's your name, if you don't mind telling me? Why do you want to know that? Want to take me out or something? <laughs> I mean, I don't mind if you don't. Winks. Please, you are not my type. Ouch, that hurt. Well, how about being friends? <laughs> Depends on how you are treating a lady. I'm just messing around. Okay then, deal. Do you like Italian? I have a great restaurant in my area. You would love it, I guarantee. Are you serious about taking me out? Well, I love Italian. Sounds great. That day... I was highly energetic at work. My colleagues were very amazed by my grand gestures. There is usually this one dog that annoyed me a lot, but I managed to keep my calm even in that situation. Pauline, my go-to buddy, came skipping towards me. She then gripped my shoulders tightly and looked at me with a cheeky grin. Girl, what's going on? Am I missing anything? Are you hiding something from me? Jesus, get a grip. You scared the shit out of me. Everything's good. I'm just really happy. Yeah, sure. Is that the reason why you've been spacing out during the case discussion today? What's the source? Ah, uh, well, I met a really cute cab driver today. His name is John. He offered to treat me to an Italian restaurant today. Say what now? A cab driver? Bro? Now, now, don't judge. I mean, is he that cute? Yes, he is. If I get a snap of him, I'll send it to you. But you better not hit on him. He's mine. <laughs> oh, please. I have eyes on someone else. He's pretty cute, too. Winks. That evening, I was picked by John. He was smelling nice and looked so good. I was nervous and fidgety. I mean... It is my first time trying to find the man. He took me to a very beautiful place by a small lake. It was a cozy place and maybe not that posh, but the food was amazing. John's deep brown eyes, framed by thick, expressive eyebrows, are his most captivating feature. They are warm and inviting, radiating kindness and sincerity. When he smiles, his eyes light up, revealing a genuine and infectious joy that draws people towards him. Gosh, it was hard to fall for that smile. We stuffed ourselves with pasta and wine and ice cream. 
a wonderful evening. He gave me another offer. He said he would make me meet his mother since she would like me a lot. The way things were moving too fast should have been a dead giveaway that this all was a red flag. So you live with your dad? Not. Dad stays with my uncle in Michigan. He got this house long back for themselves, but then mom left and he and I started to live. But you know, my dad's not a fan of staying in one place for long. He loves traveling. He owns a beautiful bike. It's old and all, but it's still sturdy to go on. He visits me sometimes, like currently he's here right now. He would leave in a week. Wow, your dad sounds like a rock star, like a total biker badass. Would he even like me? <laughs> that again depends on how you'd approach him. After all, he is the type of father who protects their daughter from a freaking fly so. And he is wary of men around me. The last time I brought a guy to my place, he scared him off just from the door. That was some scene, I swear. The guy practically pissed his pants off. Well then, how about we bet on it again? I mean, I won this time. You like the place and the food and me? So let's see if your dad likes me too. I put a bet on $20. I am winning the 20 You will not be able to win, I tell you. He is too difficult to impress. Oh, Brenda, you just don't know me yet. I am smooth Mr. Cool. I will impress your dad so hard, he would be bound to get us married. Just watch me. Okay, Mr. Confident. We quaked with laughter. I mean, I thought he was joking, but man, he was dead serious. When I returned home late, my dad was sitting right there looking very concerned. Yes, young lady, where were you? I mean, it is midnight. Oh, Dad, um, well, I was working overtime. There were a lot of clients and emergencies, so I had to stay back. I wasn't born yesterday, Brenda. Who is the man? Dad? There was no man. Please, you are overthinking. I was just with Pauline. She was... I called Pauline. She said you were outside with a friend. Who was it? Uh, okay, fine. He was just a friend, an old friend. He wanted to go out with me to chill, so I said yes, that's all. And how come I've never heard of this friend before? And why didn't you bother telling or at least calling me once? You know I'm worried about you, Bren. Sorry, Dad, I am. I would keep this in mind. He's a cab driver and he is a very sweet person, so please, you can relax. Why a cab driver? Ugh. All right, fine. Just next time, please inform your father. The next day at work, I jumped at Pauline. She was very startled at first, but then realized why I did that. Girl, why the hell did you tell my dad about John? Bruh, chill. I just said you were out with a friend, and why wouldn't I? What if that twat murdered you and dumped you somewhere? Oh, come on. He was so adorable and such a gentleman. I'll be meeting his mother soon and... and... Mother? Hell no. You're going too fast. The first date doesn't determine anything. He could be a closet perv for all you know. You want to freaking bet on it? You will lose since you're such an amazing judge of character. Don't even try. We exchanged numbers. He used to call me more than text. He'd say that he loved hearing my voice. He even gave me a proposal to visit his house, telling me that his mother was so eager to meet me. I was kind of scared because I was thinking about Pauline's words and I felt that maybe I was going too fast. I wanted to take it slow and wanted to see how things worked with him first. I told him to keep seeing each other for the time being before his mom got involved. John was persistent, but gradually understood. We just got to know each other. And as much as I love hanging out with you, I'm still new to this and I want to get to know you properly first. I mean, you are adorable and I like you, but I want to like you more, you see? Okay, I get it. And I'm sorry. I don't know why, but I've never been this excited in my life. It's always fun to have you around. 
You know what? Me too. And I'm glad to have met you. I'm an outgoing girl, but not many guys catch my eye that often. So all of this is kind of new to me too. Aha. So you're saying that I managed to catch your attention. Are you admitting the fact that I'm different from the other guys you've met? Yes, of course. Jesus, saying it out loud makes it much more embarrassing than keeping it in my head. You are the only guy, I think, with whom I can be like myself. And I too feel the same, Brenda. We started officially dating after two months of hanging out. He invited me to a baseball match. His friend was playing as a debutante in the team, and he requested both of us to pay a visit. John was sitting very close to me. He was making it so obvious that he was into me. When I locked eyes with him, he leaned in and planted a soft kiss. That was it. The spark to a forest fire. I was swooning at his charm. He had many friends. He would introduce me to them and we would drink together and come home late. John would always escort me safely to my place. My dad was always keeping an eye on him every time he dropped me off. The last time he did, my dad stopped and told him to pay a visit for some dinner. Just the three of us. Well, John already made his way to my dad's heart. It is a rare occurrence that my dad invites anyone over to his place. I bet he's eager to win his $20, lol. My dad and I arranged a nice steak party for John. We had fish, fries, a little bit of rice and Japanese curry. To wash it all down, we had Chicago's finest red wine. It was a full feast, like a lot for just three people. I wore my prettiest dress. It was his favorite color, violet. When he arrived, he was wearing a freaking tuxedo. He was looking so handsome, though. The three of us made proper acquaintances before we sat down to have our dinner. So, John, how long have you been in Chicago? Three years, sir. I know the city like the back of my hand. Oh, really now? Impressive. And you are a cab driver? <coughs> yes, sir. Babe, talk about the time when you hitchhiked a creepy man. The one which was late at night? My dad loves these kinds of stories. Babe? No, no, Brenda, not yet. Not now. Dad, we're dating, I told you. Yes, I know, but I believe in family decorum. This is not yet welcome in my house. Brenda, your father's right. His house, his rules. You can always call me babe and darling, but not here, okay? That is a good man right there. Now, John, tell me about the story of the creepy man Brenda was talking about. After dinner, when John was about to leave. Well, babe, I guess I owe you $20, right? Oh, nah, I don't need it. I'm just glad I could prove that I'm a very suave gentleman. Look at you, so full of yourself. <laughs> Bet you feel more cocky than ever. I love you, you know? I love you too. It has been a few months since John requested me to finally meet his mother. Now... I thought this was the proper time to do so. I remember how I stood nervously outside the door preparing myself to meet John's mother for the first time. A wave of anticipation washed over me. John had spoken so highly of his mother, Jackie, and I wanted nothing more than to make a good impression in front of her. I took a deep breath and knocked on the door, my heart pounding with every passing second. The door swung open, revealing a woman with a warm smile and kind eyes. She welcomed me inside with open arms and I couldn't help but feel a glimmer of relief. It seemed like everything was going well and I hoped this meeting would be the beginning of a beautiful relationship between us. Throughout the evening, Jackie showed genuine interest in getting to know me. She asked about my family, my hobbies, and my aspirations. I eagerly shared my stories, hoping to connect with her on a deeper level. As the night progressed, I started to feel more comfortable in her presence, cherishing the chance to bond with John's mother. But amidst the pleasant conversation and laughter, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off. Jackie's smile, though warm, seemed forced 
at times, and her gaze occasionally flickered with an unidentifiable emotion. I couldn't help but wonder what lay behind those eyes. As dinner came to an end, Jackie excused herself from the table, leaving John and me alone for a moment. I turned to John, my eyes filled with curiosity and concern. Do you think your mother likes me? There's something off about everything, and I can't quite put my finger on it. He excused himself too. After 20 minutes of sitting in absolute silence, they both came in with a plate of desserts. You know, Brenda, it has been a long time since I met someone as wonderful as you. My son is extremely lucky to have found you. He always had an eye for the good stuff. I mean, I won't deny it. He does find his way into people's hearts. He gets me too. You have raised your son well. So, have you guys thought of marriage yet? Did my boy pop the question? I choked so hard on my cupcake. It took me a while to get it out of my windpipe. John glared at his mother. I don't know whether that was out of anger or embarrassment. What? What? Did I say something wrong? I thought he already did it. Baby, were you going to propose to me? <laughs> <sighs> Thanks, Mom. It was true that John wanted to propose, and when we went to our next date, he popped the question. I said yes, because I was charmed by this man. The wedding was simple and calm. The reception took place in a small hotel because we didn't want John to waste too much money on these things. I was glad enough to get him as my husband. Jackie was present throughout, but she was silent. That stone-cold expression returned on her face. Her mind was probably bubbling with thoughts that I would never know. She seemed very half-hearted. I mean, I would have empathized with her if she was feeling sad that her son has grown up and was getting married. But I couldn't even empathize with her after the stunt she pulled off. John moved in with me to my house. My dad already headed back to my uncle's. He said he would visit soon. John and I more or less settled down well. We made some changes together. John turned our bedroom into his dream room. I don't mind much because I'm not picky about decor. I got to arrange the living room and a bit of the kitchen. Pauline visited us shortly after getting married. She was extremely ill, so she couldn't come before. It was nice to have her and John get to know each other. Everything felt perfect until things started missing from my house. What do you mean, missing? First it started with my accessories, then my favorite jacket. That was a costly one too. Small things are disappearing now and then. Okay, that's weird. Did you talk to John about this? I did. He kept saying, I probably misplaced it. I mean, help me look for it, but he wasn't too keen. Should I come over and help you out? I am your good luck charm after all. <laughs> it's all right. I'll deal with it just fine. I probably did misplace it. After all, I cleaned the whole freaking closet. This still didn't give me much assurance as things kept disappearing into thin air. I would often think about it at my workplace. This went on for a year, especially when John and I went on our honeymoon. I returned to a trashed house, like someone entered and they made a huge mess. There were beer bottles, unwashed dishes, and smelly clothes. I thought it was my dad since he is the only one with spare keys, but when I called him, he said that he was still at my uncle's. I didn't fill in any details because I didn't want him to get worried. I thought maybe John and I could somehow solve this issue. One day, I finished work early. At the door, when I was taking out my keys, I was somewhat feeling uneasy, like a feeling of danger washed over me. I put the keys in, but the door was not fully locked. I went inside, tiptoed, not making a single sound. It was another house intrusion. I could hear sounds from the bedroom. I took hold of an umbrella that was kept at the corner and slowly made my way to the sound. I peeked through the corner and to my astonishment, it was Jackie. She was trashing my entire closet. 
even wearing my favorite jacket. The moment a yelp of protest came out of my mouth, she turned towards me. There you are, the woman who bewitched my son. Do you think you can get away with this? What on earth? How the hell did you get in here? She suddenly lunged at me while yelling. This is my son's house, not yours, you filthy vermin. These are all mine, my things. You don't even deserve this life. The first time I saw those eyes, I saw nothing but filth. She grabbed my hair tightly. I was so scared and hurt. My hands automatically lifted themselves. The umbrella came down on her head. It was not a massive blow, thank goodness, but enough to knock her out. I called the cops and John. Jackie confessed to her misguided intentions, tearfully admitting that her actions stemmed from a deep-seated fear of losing her son. She apologized profusely, recognizing the pain she had caused in our relationship and the violation of our privacy. Her love for John had driven her to desperate measures, but she now understood the gravity of her actions. She was okay and handcuffed. I showed her and the cops my property papers as proof that I was not the crazy one there. The cops found Jackie guilty of intrusion and theft. They also gave me a warning to use weapons carefully on people. John sighed, his face filled with a mix of regret and sadness. Brenda, it's complicated. Jackie has always been overprotective and she couldn't let go of me when we got married. She had this misguided belief that she needed to protect me at all costs, even if it meant crossing boundaries. And you? Are you a child, John? Don't you have any sense of right and wrong? I'm sorry, Brenda. I didn't think this would go that far. The fact that your mother was so sweet and sugar is sickening. Her real intentions were hidden by that pretty smile of hers. Ugh, I can't take this anymore. While forgiveness wasn't immediate, I recognized that Jackie's remorse and John's stupidity were genuine. We understood that her love for her son had clouded her judgment, and we hoped that with time and healing, we could rebuild the trust that had been shattered. In the following months, we took steps to ensure our home security and protect our privacy. We changed the locks, implemented a security system, and established clear boundaries with Jackie. I was very much troubled and heartbroken by John's betrayal. I needed some space. I told him that we need to split for a while and that I need to think again with a clear head. John was understanding enough to lend me that. I gave him no access to my place, at least for the time being. My dad came and temporarily moved in till things were less tense. Jackie was in jail for a while. She would be released soon. She too was not allowed to access my life. Well, currently, I'm still healing. Things will get better eventually. John has to prove more than he should if he wants to get back in my life. My name's Amanda. I'm 28 years old. My family owns a confectionery business in Seattle, and I've been helping them out ever since I was in my early teens. My parents left the business to me and my sister to run since they were getting old and wanted to retire. It was a fun business to work in, plus my family accommodated me in a nice place to live right above the shop. I was growing up and I wanted to be independent. Every morning at 8 a.m., our shop opens and we welcome customers with a warm aroma of freshly brewed coffee and soft, creamy delectables. Chloe, my sister, was the type of person who would not help in any contribution, but be present whenever an event took place, like she would show up as if she owned the thing or something. Our parents were really tired of her not being serious and fooling around with the expenses. Even if they wanted a break, they had to come twice a week to see if everything was done smoothly. She was such a spoil sport. I disliked her. It had always been a tumultuous journey being Chloe's younger sister. I vividly remember those early years filled with constant bickering and petty arguments. Chloe had a way of making me feel like I was living in her shadow, always overshadowed by her accomplishments and dreams. As we grew older, the gap between us seemed to widen and our differences only multiplied. 
Despite our constant clashes, I yearned for a strong bond with my sister. I desperately wanted her to see me as more than just her little sister, someone she could confide in and trust. However, every time I thought we were making progress, something would come along to remind me of the deep-rooted strain between us. Chloe, please don't mess with my toys. Mom said I need to keep them safe. Oh, come on, Amanda. They're just boring old toys. Let's have some fun. They're not boring and I don't want them ruined. You always break things. I do not. Ugh, you're just no fun. Chloe and I were fighting over the toy and we both stopped pulling it in the opposite direction. The force was too much to bear, so it ended up ripping apart from the middle. See what you did? Now Mom will be so mad. Oops, my bad. But who cares? Jesus, you're such a goody two-shoes. Why would you always have to be so mean all the time, Chloe? I'm not mean, I'm just having fun. You should try it sometimes. There's a difference between having fun and being destructive, Chloe. I wish you'd understand that. You're always so perfect, little Miss Perfect. It's annoying. I'm not. I just don't want to get into trouble all the time. Oh, you're such a scared cat. You should think about others too, not just yourself. What if you broke something that I loved? Whatever. I'll find someone else to play with. Chloe storms off, leaving me feeling hurt and upset. This was always the case between me and her. She just couldn't stand me. It became worse as we grew up. It started with taking my things to bully me in school. She often tossed my bag or tiffin box. Her attitude only grew worse. My constant attempt of establishing something decent kept failing. One such incident left an indelible mark on my heart and was when she stole away my fiancé from me. Our relationship was blossoming into something beautiful, but as soon as Chloe heard about Jacob, her demeanor changed. I could sense her jealousy as she couldn't bear the thought of me finding happiness in someone else's arms. It wasn't long before Chloe started putting seeds of doubt in Jacob's mind about our relationship. She would whisper poison into his ear, painting me as someone unworthy of his love and affection. The more she tried to create rifts between us, the more I felt torn between my love for Jacob and my desire to salvage any semblance of sisterly connection with Chloe. Why would you ever do something like that? What have I ever done to you to deserve this? You, you always did this. Why? Just why? Oh, little sis, about to cry again. Jacob was dating a sore loser until now. I'll always be the showstopper in your life, Amanda. You can't ever have the good things in life. Besides, have you seen yourself in the mirror? That was my relationship. You had no right to take it away from me. I have given you all the things you desired, all my toys, my friends, my room, my freaking car. You took them all and you are still not content. You want my fiancé too? Oh, will you stop yapping? Your voice is hella annoying, man. Look, Missy, I did you a favor. That guy was never meant to be with you anyway. I mean, if he cheats on you that fast, might as well call it quits. I remember how it all started through a freaking dating app. I had my 26th birthday and my friends were encouraging me to start an account and search for potential mates. At first, I was laughing about it, telling them that dating apps are absolute trash and only creeps would want to be your soulmates. But every time I finished my shift at work and come home feeling a bit lonely and tired, I couldn't help but think about the possibility that maybe it might be a great idea to check out at least once. One evening, as I sat in my cozy apartment, I decided to give the world of dating apps a try, hoping to find someone to explore this city with. Little did I know that my life was about to change from the most beautiful to the worst way ever. At first, I was getting used to the interface, but then slowly and surely, I was all up and going. I scrolled through the app, swiping left and right, but none of the profiles really caught my attention until I stumbled upon Jacob's. His profile picture showed a warm smile that instantly melted my heart. 
and his bio was filled with humor and kindness. Without hesitation, I swiped right, hoping he'd do the same. A few days passed, and just when I was beginning to lose hope, I received a notification that made my heart skip a beat. It was a match. Jacob had swiped right, too. Hey there, Amanda. How's it going? Kind of new to this app, so please bear with me. <laughs> oh, really? Me too. I just downloaded a few days back. It's so strange how people get matched here. I'm just glad it's you. I really liked your bio and was keen to get to know you. To be honest, I had half expectations that we would match. Oh, come on. Don't underestimate yourself so much. Your profile was very striking too, especially where you added only cat people. I unfortunately have a dog. I hope it won't come in the way. <laughs> we engaged in a back and forth conversation, sharing bits and pieces of our lives, hobbies and interests. Wow, your family runs a bakery. That is so freaking cool. I bet the menu is tasty as hell. You're always welcome to try. <laughs> As the conversation progresses, we discovered shared interests and a sense of humor. I don't know why when people find out I'm an engineer, they would ask me, how many bridges have I built? Like it has happened so many times, it does not feel like a joke anymore. Really? I didn't know that was a thing. Engineering is such a respectful job, you must be really busy. True. It's a pretty decent job with pretty decent pay, but not as exciting as yours, though. I would love to wake up every day to freshly baked pastries. Oh, my God. As we continue to chat, Jacob suggested that we meet in person. I felt nervous but excited at the same time. He told me he would love to visit our bakery. He also added if I could manage to save him some glazed donuts since he loves them a lot. I remember him walking into our shop, searching for my face at the counter, and when our eyes finally met, it felt like time had stopped. We greeted each other with a warm side hug, and all my nerves vanished in an instant. I was glad he wasn't catfishing. He looked exactly like his picture, rather much attractive up front. My parents were kind of startled by this gesture. They didn't expect that I would be the one making the move. They welcomed Jacob to spend some time with them after work. Either it was them being overprotective or them being really caring. They decided to stay the whole time when Jacob was present. It was more like a group date, to be honest. The next time we met, we explored the city together, trying out new restaurants, attending concerts, and simply enjoying each other's company. With every passing day, our connection grew stronger, and it became evident that we had found something truly special. Chloe noticed, but she was too full of herself to appreciate anything. Whenever she used to see me with Jacob, she would scream, Bad choice, or Ew, gross, take it someplace else. She always had a habit of publicly demeaning me and making fun of me. One day, I got old juju on her by confronting her antics. Chloe, like, can you not shut the hell up? Do you always have to make such a scene? What? I was just saying the truth. You guys were drooling at each other like some 90s kids drooling at their first candy. If you want to get finicky, you know, love hotels are always available. The bakery isn't your honeymoon. And since when did you care about the bakery, huh? Who was the one spending all the hard-earned expenses on Jimmy Choo's and Chanel? Like, you know damn well that shit's pricey, and still, you are so shameless. You are not my mother, little brat. I can do whatever I want. It's not just your shop. I have equal rights to this property. Piss off, sociopath. Jesus, mom should have left you somewhere. Our parents were so tired of us fighting constantly. They tried to separate us from a very early age, but somehow we always managed to piss each other off. There were times she and I would have fist fights. I know how toxic this sounds, but her behavior was causing a lot of hindrance in our mental health. I started to hate her, but I also felt bad that a chance of potential sisterhood was never happening. To keep my mind off things, I kept my focus on my relationship with Jacob. 
He owned a really good house. I mean, he was an established engineer. He had successful projects and his portfolio was damn clean. When he invited me to his place, I was really scared. I didn't know how his parents would react to me. I mean, their son is extremely talented and I'm just plain old me running my family business with no talent of my own whatsoever. But it didn't go as bad as I thought it to be. His parents arranged a feast, which I felt was really unnecessary because I eat so little. I could barely stuff my face with food. They were having a conversation while I was trying to keep up with them. More or less, it was a great day. Things started to take a weird turn when Chloe started to seduce Jacob. At first, it started with subtly, like, light touches on his shoulders or stroking his back gently whenever she got the chance. This happened for a year. Jacob seemed not to mind or feel bothered by this at all, which should have been a red flag. But I thought he was just being oblivious. I mean, he freaking proposed to me. I felt my heart soar as he got down on one knee and asked me to be his partner for life. Through tears of joy, I said yes, feeling an overwhelming rush of happiness and gratitude. I so knew I didn't do the right thing. Don't you think you guys are rushing into the thing a bit? Like, he's not running anywhere. She was sitting at the back of the office of the shop eating a freshly baked macaroon. You were not supposed to eat that, Chloe. That was a fresh batch. Oh, no one will notice. We make plenty of batches every day. Oh, really? Do you even know how difficult it is to make macarons? Have you ever tried baking one? Oh, so you want to lecture me now? Do you really think people take you seriously? Like, if you do, you are mad, delusional. I'm not here to argue with you. I'm just here to remind you that we can't have fresh batches. That is not professional. If you really feel like you have the caliber to run this shop, then I think it's time you act like one. Chloe aggressively stood up. The table rumbled as she came up towards me and stood face to face with me. Stop talking like you are my father, you runt. Know your place. You are nothing but a sad little puppy who's always looked down upon. First from our parents, and now Jacob. I froze. I didn't know what else to say. I just silently went away from the scene. I cried a lot in the bathroom that day. It didn't stop there. Things were going in a certain way, but the arrogance of Chloe increased, and now she became even more desperate. She wanted to tag along everywhere we went. She would call Jacob her best brother-in-law, but then proceed to be extremely handsy with him. I was feeling uncomfortable. I tried my best to have a conversation with Jacob, but she would always interrupt. I wouldn't lie, but Chloe was way more attractive than I was. She would wear dresses and doll herself up while I preferred light makeup and baggy clothes. Things started to get weirder when Jacob was invited to a work party. It was celebrated on a personal yacht. I was getting hella insecure. If I knew how posh his lifestyle was, I would have thought about not going with him. I was a very simple girl, and a gala life was not mine, but definitely a thing for Chloe. Weirdly, she was invited. Like, I was the freaking fiancé, but he evidently enjoyed Chloe's company more. He introduced me and Chloe to his friends. I was getting really conscious, but Chloe was super confident. After a small interaction, I went to the bar counter and started to drink impulsively. A few shots later, when I was not able to stand anymore, I tripped two steps backwards and collided with someone. I turned around to see a tall man wearing a black suit and a white tie. He was talking to another woman with a drink in his hand. Whoa, lady, are you okay? Um, um, I'm really sorry. I didn't see you there. I'm just a bit buzzed. I'll be okay. Are you sure? We can provide some lime juice if you want. It will help you with that buzzing head of yours. That, that would be really nice, actually. I think I overdid it. He took me to one of the private compartments and made me sit. After five minutes, a glass of fresh lime juice arrived and was given to me. His name was Michael. He ordered another whiskey for himself. 
While we waited, he struck up a conversation with me, and to my surprise, I found Michael to be genuinely kind and easy to talk to. We laughed and shared stories and discovered common interests. As the night progressed, we continued to enjoy each other's company, and he made sure I felt included and cared for. It was as if we had known each other for ages, and the connection we had was unexpected but undeniable. As the party came to a close, Jacob called me on the phone asking where I was, so I quickly excused myself from Michael and left. He requested me to stay in touch with him, so I gave him my number. He smiled. He really liked my company and wanted to continue the conversation further. Where the hell were you? I was looking for you everywhere. At the restroom. Sorry, I was really drunk and I wanted to throw up. Why can't you take some responsibility? You know this is my office party. If people found out who you are to me, then it would have been so embarrassing. Thanks to Chloe, she maintained her composure pretty well throughout. My colleagues absolutely loved her. I was silent the whole time in the car. I know I messed up. I was so busy talking to Michael. Wait, should I tell him about Michael? But what if he gets angry? I won't be able to deal with it. Throughout the ride, I could see Chloe's satisfactory smirk. She was always happy whenever I was miserable. I never thought that my life could take such a painful turn. It was a sunny afternoon, and I decided to surprise Jacob with a visit to his place and apologize for all the things I had done at his party. As I approached his front door, my heart was filled with love and excitement, eager to see the man I thought was my husband. But as I stepped closer, I heard hushed voices coming from inside. At first, I dismissed it as maybe Jacob talking to a friend or his parents, but something inside me couldn't shake the feeling of unease. Ignoring the nagging doubt, I opened the door, hoping for a warm welcome. To my horror, the sight that greeted me was like a punch to the gut. There, in the living room, I saw Jacob and Chloe, my own sister, locked in a passionate embrace. It felt like the world stood still for a moment as I processed the heartbreaking scene before me. The shock turned into disbelief and then into an overwhelming surge of pain and betrayal. I couldn't believe what I was witnessing. I wanted to scream to confront them, but my voice failed me, and I felt paralyzed. Finally, finding my voice, I managed to choke out their names, and they quickly pulled away from each other. Chloe looked angry, and Jacob attempted to explain, but the words fell on deaf ears. The betrayal was too much to bear, and I said what I had to, and fled from the apartment, tears streaming down my face. Hey, hey, Amanda, where are you? What happened? I called Michael, unable to process the entire situation. Can I please come over? Like, please, I can't. I feel like I'm going to faint. Oh shit! Wait. Tell me where you are. I'm coming to pick you up. I had secretly kept contact with him because I felt really nice talking to him. He became my very good friend, even if it was a momentary experience. I knew that he would be the one who would be helping me. After that scenario, I never faced them ever again. I told my dad to take over the shop while I took a break. My relationship with Michael became really strong, and he took great care of me. Evidently, Chloe didn't come back to the shop, and she moved in with Jacob. They were really happy with me gone from their lives. Michael and I tried to rebuild our friendship. We would go out and spend time together. Wait, you are the boss. What? Why didn't you tell me before? Because people get wary, so I didn't want to scare you away. <laughs> oh my God, Jacob would. He would. Damn, what's going on in that head of yours? Actually, I just am waiting for the right time. I feel like we'll be meeting them soon. I had a detailed discussion with my parents about Chloe. They were very disappointed and disgusted with her behavior. They never thought she would reach that extent, so it was decided I would be in charge of the shop. Meanwhile, me and Michael started dating. It has been. Eight months. His birthday was coming, so I wanted to buy him something. We thought of going to a supermarket to get him a nice pair of jeans and a shirt. He was shy at first, but agreed later on. 
We were roaming the streets and looking for a good shop when suddenly I saw two very familiar faces in the distance. It was Chloe and Jacob. They seemed to be arguing about something. As we approached, Chloe looked at us mockingly. Oh, isn't it the dear little sister? Oh, and I see you've found yourself a protege. Perfect for you. Uh, Chloe? So, who is this broke-ass boyfriend? Another fish from your dating app? Man, you do have bad choices. Jeez. So, what story did you cook up to him to get his attention? Chloe, please, shh. What? Hello, Jacob. Good seeing you here. He, hey, boss, um, I, uh, well, wait, boss? Yes, and this broke-ass man is my soon-to-be husband. We are engaged. Well, I hope you guys are really happy together. Thanks a lot, Jacob. We left them in awe and shock. It was so satisfactory. My parents demanded Chloe never come back to the shop if she didn't fix her attitude. Jacob, on the other hand, was always kept on edge. Michael gave him subtle threats of firing him just to play with his feeble emotion. It was good riddance. I could finally be serious about the shop. Michael was a huge support and I was so happy to ever have met him. Hello, my name's Chloe and I'm a 30-year-old cishet woman. I wish I could go back in time and tell 13-year-old Chloe and basically any little girl that dreaming of a Prince Charming and an overall picture-perfect marriage with great in-laws is a waste of time. Because let me tell you, it really hit me like a truck. My mother-in-law, Emma, and my husband, Noah, made sure to give me that rude awakening. It all began when Noah and I said our I do's. I had this vision of our families blending smoothly like something straight out of a fairy tale. Oh boy, was I in for a surprise. Little did I know that Emma and Noah would team up to become the dynamic duo of toxicity, always testing my patience and sanity. Right from the start, it was clear as day that Emma my nightmare of a mother-in-law, was going to be a constant pain in the neck. Me, I avoid drama like it's the plague, so I tried my best to keep things peaceful and make it work. But let me tell you, Emma had a special talent for pushing all my buttons. Man, let me tell you, dealing with her was like walking on eggshells all the time. I never knew when she'd unleash her disapproval on me. I tried everything to win her over, going out of my way to get her thoughtful gifts, hoping it'd bring us closer. But instead of softening her heart, it seemed to make her even more hostile. I still remember her snide remarks tearing down my efforts and making it clear she wanted nothing to do with me, not even if I had the cure for cancer. Her rejection hit me like a ton of bricks each time. It wasn't just the mean words she said, it was the fact that Noah my own husband, didn't do much to stand up for me. He was stuck in this loop of trying to please his mother, leaving me to fend for myself. It was like a one-two punch, dealing with Emma's toxic behavior and Noah's indifference, lack of intervention. I felt so alone in my own marriage, like my voice didn't matter at all in our relationship. I carried the weight of Emma's disapproval on my shoulders every step of the way. It was like a nagging voice in my head just piling onto my anxiety. I ended up always questioning my worth and it made me feel sick. The toll it took on my mental and emotional well-being was undeniable. All I wanted was a loving and peaceful family dynamic where we could all accept and understand each other, but it felt like an impossible dream in reality. Little did I know life was about to take a wild turn I never saw coming. What happened next was going to challenge me, empower me, and take me on a journey of self-discovery and happiness. But hold on tight, because this ride's going to be a roller coaster full of surprises. Feeling the weight of Emma's disapproval on my shoulders, I knew I had to deal with this elephant in the room. So I gathered up my courage and decided to host a brunch at my place. 
I wanted to create a safe space to tackle all the underlying issues that had been causing trouble for way too long. When Emma showed up, she gave my home this critical once-over, finding faults in every little thing. Oh, I see you've redecorated again. It looks like dog crap. Aren't you embarrassed? I know I would be. I gotta tell you, I tried my best to keep calm and focus on what really mattered. It was time to gather my courage and get to the heart of the matter. So with my voice shaking, I politely confronted Emma and asked her straight up what her problem was. I was hoping for an honest talk, but boy was I in for a surprise. As soon as I asked, Emma's face twisted with anger. She exploded like a volcano, throwing insults and shouting at me with a tone that would make the devil himself squirm. Her words hit me like a slap. Not only did she attack my character, but she also spat on my dreams and belittled everything I tried to do. It hurt so bad, and I couldn't hold back the tears anymore. At that moment, I realized that confronting Emma would only ever make things worse. Her intentions weren't about resolving anything. They were all about her insecurities and need to control everything. It was a tough truth to face. It shattered my hopes of having a happy, smooth relationship. If this was some random girl I was friends with, best believe I would have cut her off a long time ago. But this was my mother-in-law. There was no escaping this. I just couldn't take it anymore. I had to get away from that emotional assault. So I excused myself from the table, tears streaming down my face. Emma's words kept echoing in my head, just dampening the mood entirely. In that vulnerable moment, I couldn't help but wonder if anything could ever bridge the gap between us. I had no clue that hitting that breaking point would trigger such a huge change within me. From feeling down in the dumps, a newfound strength started to grow. I was dead set on rewriting this story, reclaiming my self-worth and finding a path that embraced who I really am. After that terrible incident, I made sure to steer clear of any unnecessary run-ins with Emma. I thought maybe if I kept my distance, we could avoid another blowout. But no matter what I did, Emma was hell-bent on keeping her toxic behavior going, even from afar. She started bombarding me with these awful text messages, each one meant to tear me down further. And let me tell you, even though I was set on becoming a stronger person, those insults really got to me. I couldn't just shake them off, especially not overnight. The stress and anxiety they caused were eating me up, and it felt like I was stuck in some never-ending nightmare. I was desperate for support, so I turned to Noah, hoping he'd have my back. I poured my heart out, telling him all about Emma's relentless attacks and how they were messing with my head. But man, his response was not what I expected. Noah pretty much brushed off my concerns, acting like they were no big deal. He just said to ignore it and not let it bother me. It was like he couldn't understand the emotional toll it was taking on me. Feeling like he didn't get me at all left me even more hurt and alone. It felt like I was fighting this battle all on my own. Come on, Chloe, you're so sensitive. I know my mom can say some less than nice things, but seriously, you should grow a backbone. He acted like my feelings were no big deal, and it hurt so much. I thought he'd support me, but instead he just undermined what I was going through. I felt so alone and frustrated. We got into this huge argument about it. I tried explaining how much Emma's behavior was messing with me, but he couldn't take it seriously. He kept telling me to just brush it off and not make a fuss. I even told him that dealing with his mom's constant attacks had pushed me to the point of needing anxiety meds again, but he didn't seem to get it. To make matters worse, he even threatened to leave me if I couldn't handle his mother. It was like a stab to the heart, playing on my fear of being alone. I felt stuck in this toxic cycle where my well-being was sacrificed just to keep the peace in our relationship. 
Months dragged on and I was still silently putting up with Emma's toxic behavior while Noah turned a blind eye. It was exhausting and emotionally draining and I felt so isolated. But then one day as I was cleaning the house, I stumbled upon something that changed everything. I found a list of debts that Emma had piled up over time and it hit me that maybe paying off her debts could be a way to finally bridge the gap between us and find some peace. It was a risky move, but I was ready to try anything to mend our relationship. Excited about the idea, I went to Noah and told him my plan. I hoped he would understand where I was coming from, but he said something that stepped on that budding hope. Chloe... It's already been taken care of. My aunt stepped in and paid off the debts. Well, at least she said she would. Oh, I see. I just wanted to help, Noah. I thought this could be an opportunity to show your mom that I'm willing to go the extra mile. Maybe I can get her a spa day voucher or something. Chloe, it's not necessary. You always try to do things your way, thinking money can solve everything. Just drop it, okay? She doesn't need your help. But Noah, it's not just about the money. It's about showing compassion and trying to build my relationship with your mom. I just wanted to make things right. (sighs) Can't you understand? It's not going to change anything. This constant need to fix things, it's driving me crazy. Weren't you the one talking about the anxiety my mom gives you? Doing something like that would definitely send her over the edge. God, it's like you want her to hate you. Feeling defeated, I decided to let it go. Knowing I didn't need another showdown with Cruella Devil. But man, I couldn't have imagined what was about to go down after that chat with Noah. The very next day, Emma barged into the living room like a tornado on a rampage. She was furious, launching into a full-on verbal attack, convinced I was the one behind the mysterious payoff of her debts. I was sitting there, frozen in the living room, anxiety churning in my gut as Emma burst through the front door. The fire in her eyes was impossible to miss, and it was all aimed right at me, because I couldn't even say a word. She unleashed this relentless fury of accusations. So, you paid off my debts, huh? Who do you think you are meddling in my affairs? You think you're Bill Gates or something? I never wanted a penny from you. Confused, I began to explain myself, but she wouldn't let me speak. Don't try and defend yourself now. You think I'm stupid? Noah sent me a text last night saying, She paid off all of your debts. I knew it was you because you always had a knack for doing crap like this, but I've had enough of you. Noah then appeared in the doorway, startled by the commotion, and asked what was happening. His face showed a mix of confusion and concern. What's going on here? Why are you so upset, Mom? She was shaking with rage. I thought the vein in her forehead was about to pop. Your wife here thinks she can play savior and pay off my debts without my consent. I won't tolerate this blatant disrespect. She thinks I'm some charity case? Well, she's got another thing coming. I tried to speak to defend myself, but Emma wouldn't hear any of it. Divorce her now, Noah. She's nothing but trouble. I won't have her meddling in our family affairs and ruining our lives any longer. Tears streamed down my face as Emma's words cut deep into my already wounded heart. Noah facepalmed, clearly frustrated with the situation. Mom, calm down. I should have been clearer. I'm sorry. Let me explain. Emma didn't even bat an eye at Noah's desperate pleas. She was completely consumed by rage and went on a rampage, smashing anything in the path. The whole situation felt so melodramatic and overwhelming. Right then and there, it hit me hard. No matter how hard I tried to fix things, Emma's deep-seated hatred for me seemed impossible to overcome. The toxicity in that family ran deep and I felt totally powerless to change it. But amid the chaos, I saw Noah spring into action. He was trying to physically restrain his mother, desperate to get her attention and make her listen. 
Mom, listen to me. I didn't mean Chloe paid off your debts. It was Aunt Judy who offered to help. I thought you already knew it was her because we had talked about it earlier, remember? Oh. But I just received a text from her. She mentioned that an unexpected expense came up and it will take more time for the money to come through. As Noah's words sunk in, I noticed Emma's tense body language start to relax and a hint of realization crossed her face. It was obvious she had jumped to conclusions, but her stubborn pride kept her from offering an apology. Instead, she was dead set on finding some other way to shift the blame onto me. Well, if it wasn't you, then why didn't you say that? As I realized Emma's complete disregard for my emotions, sadness quickly turned into anger boiling within me. And to top it all off, there was my favorite vase, a precious keepsake from my late grandmother, shattered into pieces on the floor. You've crossed the line, Emma. That vase was from my grandma and you've destroyed it. What is wrong with you? Emma must have sensed that her usual strategy of just attacking everything wasn't going to work this time. She tried to switch gears and started showering me with sweet talk, hoping to win me over and get me to still help her out. But there was no way I was letting her off the hook that easily. Chloe, listen, we can find a way to fix this. Please, just hear me out. I was so angry, and all I could see was the mess Emma had created. My voice trembled as I tried to stay determined. No, Emma, I've had enough. I'm calling the police. This has gone too far, and I refuse to be treated like this any longer. My heart was racing as I grabbed the phone, feeling both determined and scared. The room felt heavy with tension and our shattered relationship was weighing us down. With my hand shaking, I dialed 911, knowing it was the only way to stop the chaos that had taken over our once peaceful home. Noah and Emma tried to talk me out of it, their pleas ringing in my ears, but I knew there was no going back now. I had made up my mind and I was set on finding safety and peace. Hello. There are people in my house causing a disturbance and distress. I need them to be removed from the property immediately. As I told the authorities what was happening, Emma tried to act all sweet and innocent, attempting to regain control of the situation, but it was so fake. Chloe, please, let's talk this through. I know you have the means to help me out of this predicament. Think about how it would benefit both of us. Emma, I gotta be real with you. I can see how desperate you are, but I'm not gonna give you a single dime. You've treated me like garbage and caused so much hurt. And now, all of a sudden, you want my help because you're desperate? Nah, that isn't how it works. Remember how you wouldn't even look my way before? Now you think it's cool to waltz into my house and wreck my stuff? You've got some serious issues and it's high time you face the music for what you've done. Professional help might be a good idea for you. You can't just get away with everything. Consequences are coming your way. Noah interjected, his frustration mounting as he sided with his mother. Chloe, you're being unreasonable. Can't you just see how much stress this is causing everyone? Just give her the money and let's move on. And call off the police too. That was so uncalled for. Unreasonable? Noah, you are such a dirtbag. You only care about yourself and you always disregard my feelings. I won't allow myself to be manipulated any longer. And yeah, I might have wanted to help your good-for-nothing mother once upon a time, but I see now how foolish it was for me to even hold her in such a regard. That room was like a pressure cooker. I kept on yelling at Emma and Noah to get out. You could cut the tension with a knife and it was clear that our relationship was in pieces. Noah was begging me to back down, promising that he would start listening to me and that things would get better between us, but I couldn't ignore the truth. It was too late for that. Noah's desperation was boiling over and he was getting more and more worked up and aggressive, wanting to intimidate me into submission. It scared the hell out of me and I knew I had to get out of there before things got even uglier. So without thinking twice, I ran for it, just wanting to be safe until the police arrived. As I dashed away, my neighbors started coming out, curious and concerned about all the noise. One of them asked me what was going on. 
as they'd heard the commotion from their homes. It felt like a lifeline knowing they were there to support me through this chaotic mess. Please, you have to understand, my husband and mother-in-law have made me fear for my safety. She's been aggressive and destructive. I've already called the police. Don't worry, Chloe. We've got your back. We heard everything. They need to be held accountable for their actions. Absolutely. We'll tell the police everything we've witnessed. You shouldn't have to endure this kind of treatment. It happened so fast. And then suddenly those flashing police car lights lit up the whole street. I felt a mix of relief and nervousness knowing help was on the way. The officers arrived quickly and started asking questions, paying close attention as my neighbors and I spilled the beans about everything that went down. It was like giving them a full rundown of the whole situation. Having the police there brought a sense of order to the crazy scene in my house. Their professionalism and authority gave me a bit of hope that things might finally be handled properly and that I could finally get the safety and peace of mind I was desperately seeking. Ma'am, we're here to ensure your safety. If you're comfortable, could you provide us with a statement about what transpired? Of course, officer. I just want to feel safe in my own home. They've caused so much distress and I can't live like this anymore. So there I was, spilling all the juicy details to the police officers and let me tell you, they were fully tuned in. Their expressions turned all serious as I shared what had gone down and it felt good to know they were taking me seriously. It was like a weight had been lifted off my shoulders. Before you knew it, the cops marched over to Noah and Emma and they weren't messing around. They gave them a stern warning and told them to cooperate and come along peacefully to the police vehicles waiting outside. It was like a scene straight out of a movie and I couldn't help but feel a sense of justice finally being served. Chloe, please call off the police. We can work this out. It's too late for that, Noah. I've endured enough. It's time for the law to intervene. My neighbors were there for me, supporting and encouraging my decision, and even urging the police to take action. It meant a lot to have their solidarity and care during such a tough time. With their support, I felt stronger and more determined than ever. After cutting ties with Noah and Emma, I finally felt a sense of relief. Their toxic influence was gone and I could breathe freely again. Each day felt brighter, filled with a newfound peace that I hadn't experienced in a long time. No more living in fear and uncertainty. It was my chance to rebuild, heal and create a life that was truly mine. News spread quickly in the neighborhood confirming my suspicions. Emma's financial situation took a hit and her home got repossessed because of Aunt Judy's broken promise. It was a clear reflection of the destructive path she chose. Despite the turmoil, Emma still tried to reach out to me, maybe seeking help. But I knew better than to fall for it. I took legal measures to protect myself and got a restraining order against her, ensuring my safety and peace of mind. As time went on, I focused on my healing journey. Therapy became a vital tool in rebuilding my self-esteem and finding my voice again. Supported by friends and neighbors who stuck by me, I rediscovered my strength and resilience. The unexpected benefit was that my anxiety decreased significantly. Noah and Emma's toxic presence no longer weighed me down, allowing me to reclaim my inner peace. I started thriving, pursuing my passions and dreams with a newfound energy. Gone were the days of living in fear. I embraced my true self, valuing my worth and refusing to settle for anything less than love and respect. The healing journey wasn't over, but I celebrated the progress I had made. Life continued and I welcomed new opportunities surrounded by genuine connections and the sense of belonging. The scars of the past began to fade and I grew stronger, knowing that I had survived and come out wiser on the other side.